Rick Sias, University of Arizona. Uh, thank you, the organizers, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I really enjoyed today's presentations. I learned a lot. Uh, it was really good. Uh, Robel had one concern, one question that, that I didn't care for, which was he defined 50 as old. Uh, <laughs> but, but other than that, it's a good conference. Um, so we're good. Uh, this is with uh, two of my dear friends, Laura Starks and Harry Turtle. Uh, who I've worked with for a very long time, and we're gonna. Uh, this was our foray into molecular genetics. Uh, so, it, it, a little bit different than maybe what we've been doing most of today. Uh, we're gonna look at stock market participation and risk aversion and beliefs about the stock market and how molecular genetics may relate to that. Uh, so, I thought I'd start with just a little bit of kind of the background of the question, uh, which is, you know, in a classic economic model. We think almost everybody should hold stock, and most people should hold almost all their wealth in equity, uh, at least with the risk premiums that we've observed in the United States. So in these type of models, we typically just think of equity or how much you have in the stock market as a function of your risk aversion and a function of your perceived return distribution. And in these models, we generally just say risk aversion because everybody uses the same model to form the return distribution belief, uh, and everybody looks at the same historical data, so that's the same for everybody. Empirically, however, we see a lot of variation in stock market participation, right? Most individuals in the U.S. do not hold money in the stock market, right? In the U.S., if you exclude retirement accounts, kind of the best estimate we have now is about uh, a third of people invest in the stock market. If you include retirement accounts, it's more like 40%. Uh, participation rates in Europe, depending on the country you go to, but generally Northern Europe does better in Southern Europe, uh, but participation rates in Europe tend to be even lower than the U.S. So. In finance, we just call this the stock market participation puzzle or non-participation puzzle or under-participation puzzle, but some sort of puzzle. Uh, so what explains it? And we think kind of, when, when you look at this literature, it's kind of four broad categories that people talk about. Uh, one is participation costs, which was mentioned earlier today. Just the fact that, you know, there's some cost to enter the stock market, right? You have to learn about the stock market, get a separate account, uh, you know, things like that. So low wealth, for example, could explain why some people don't invest in the stock market. Non-standard preferences, so ambiguity aversion, for example, could be something that keeps people from uh, investing in the stock market. There's a whole bunch of what just kind of get grouped into this information-based explanations. Uh, and I, I'm going to just kind of put them all together here. But things like distrust of financial markets. So if you think that if you enter the stock market, you're likely to get you know, ripped off or that you'll be taken advantage of, you know, maybe that's a, that's a reason to keep you out of the stock market. And then finally, we know at least empirically that people do have different uh, perceptions of the return distribution, right? Uh, and that does seem to matter. So kind of where things are. Empirically, when we look at the literature, what you really see is that, you know, the two things that we think should matter, risk aversion and beliefs, do matter, right? People who are more risk averse are less likely to hold stock. People who are more bullish are more likely to hold stock, right? We also find, though, that if you control for risk aversion and beliefs, Millions of other things matter, right? Not millions, but many other things matter, right? Education, cognitive ability, trust, sociability, optimism. Uh, you know, with your the kind of depression babies type story, right? That if you're raised in a depression, you're less likely to invest in the stock market. Uh, uh, BMI and height impact stock market participation. Health impact stock market participation. Lots of things matter. There's actually a much longer list than this, but this is the list of characteristics that we have in our data. So that's what I'm focusing on. And then we also know, and, and much of this work was done by people in the audience today, interestingly, uh, which came as, I think, a surprise to many people in finance, but not a surprise to anybody that does genetics research, uh, that you know, a lot of this is heritable, right? So stock market station, probably about a third heritable. So about, you know, not an uncommon number at all, right? Uh, everything there was kind of done in the Swedish tw Twins Registry. But these two kind of literatures are, are you know, very separate, right? I mean, heritability, you can't really you know, it's just kind of, you know, a number, right? What fraction of stock market participation is heritable? So what we're going to try to do in this study is we're going to look at where polygenic scores predict stock market participation, where they predict risk aversion, where they predict beliefs about the stock market, and then try to understand why. We'll basically do a mediation analysis. Uh, and then really try to tie these two literatures together, understand, uh, try to understand a little bit more about why stock market participation, why risk aversion might be heritable, things like that. <clears throat> so. I'm going to look at six questions today, and it, it'll, it'll be less painful than, than it looks here. But, you know, we're just going to start out by saying we, we just regress stock market participation, risk aversion, and beliefs are in these polygenic scores, right, and standard controls, which I'll talk about later. Then the second thing we'll do is say, well, look, 
we know that these polygenic scores are predicting stock market rotation. Our risk aversion and beliefs, the things that are in a classic economic model, right? the reasons they are, they're the mediating factors that are driving stock market participation. Now, we think that the polygenic scores, we're going we're to hypothesize before, uh, that the polygenic scores will help predict stock market participation, even when we control for risk aversion and beliefs, for a couple of reasons. One, and probably the most obvious one, is that they're correlated, they're going to predict other things that matter, right? Like participation costs. People, you know, the higher educational attainment polygenic score is going to predict greater income. You're going to have lower participation costs, right? So that makes sense. The other part, which I think you hear less often, and I won't take credit for it, actually comes from a finance paper that looked at a, a blood enzyme uh, and risk aversion uh, years and years ago. Uh, but, you know, it's also possible that, you know, these biological measures are actually you know, capturing some of the variation in this that we're not capturing when we survey it, right? So if you ask Kevin and I, what's our risk aversion? And we both say on a scale of one to 10, we will say five, right? Maybe you get more information by actually adding our polygenic scores to it. Maybe that, you know, you say, okay, Rick is actually more likely more risk averse. Maybe that's what we're capturing. So, you know, it, 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 there really could be kind of two ways that the polygenic scores have some effect beyond kind of what we think of in a traditional sense. All right, third thing we're gonna do is look at whether these polygenic scores are predicting these characteristics that we know are related to, to uh, stock participation or risk aversion and beliefs. So things like trust and BMI and education, uh, things like that. And then we're gonna say, same sort of thing. We'll do a mediation analysis. We'll say, are the polygenic scores predicting stock participation because they're predicting trust, right? Or are the polygenic scores predicting risk aversion because they're predicting trust, right? We'll look at that. And then the last two questions are a little bit different. <laughs> uh, we, and we kind of motivated these questions was when we started this work, some of the, the comments we got were, well, how important is this? And we we're trying to figure out a way to kind of think about how important it is in driving these relations. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, how important are these polygenic scores in explaining the relationship between risk aversion and beliefs and stock market participation? And what we'll do is we'll just kind of break risk aversion and beliefs into the part that's predicted by these polygenic scores and the part that's not predicted by these polygenic scores. And doing that, we can just partition in R square and say, okay, it's, it's how much of this relation can we use, can these polygenic scores predict that? So this is not, this is not a measure of heritability, right? We're not saying how heritable is stock market space. What we're saying is, is it the part of risk aversion that's predicted by polygenic scores predicting stock market participation, or is the start of, part of risk aversion not predicted by polygenic scores predicting stock market participation? And then finally, we'll do the same thing with characteristics. So just like, is it the part of, is it the polygenic score, the PGS component of trust, or the non-PGS component of trust that's predicting stock market participation? All right. Usually when I present this paper, I, I spend a lot of time talking about the health and retirement study and genetics and GWAS and polygenic scores. Uh, so I, I don't have to today, so I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, health retirement study, you all know about that. Uh, the genetic data sample started in 2006. We're actually going to be a little bit different here, uh, and I'll tell you why. We're going we're gonna to look at surveys starting in 2010, and really what changed in the HRS in 2010 was before 2010, HRS asked people, what, are the, what is the likelihood the market will increase in the next year? Right? The market will be higher one year from today. In 2010, they started asking them not only the likelihood it goes up, but the likelihood it goes up 20% and the likelihood it goes down 20%, right? Or at least 20%, right? So that actually tells you something about the distribution people are looking at rather than just kind of one point in the distribution. Uh, so that's why we start in 2010. We have about 5,000 individuals, about, you know, it's a panel, so about 13,000 observations, a little over 13,000 observations. Uh, I used to think that we had a lot of data in this study, but when I saw the first paper this morning, I took that back. Um, so we're going to look at eight PGSs, which seems like a really reasonable number now. Uh, <laughs> so, and we kind of selected our PGSs based on kind of the characteristics literature, right? So we know that higher educational attainment is associated with stock market participation. So you pick an EA PGS, right? We know uh, IQ test is, is associated with stock market participation. So we kind of we kind of put these in four groups. So that's kind of the education cognition group. We know personality is associated with stock market participation. People who are more optimistic are more likely to hold stock. Uh, so we pick neuroticism, depressive symptoms. We know health is related to stock market participation. Uh, heart disease is what kills most people in the world and certainly most Americans. Uh, so we look at two heart disease measures. Uh, and then finally, we know that body shape uh, is associated with stock market participation. So we're gonna look at BMI and height. The outcome variables we look at is we're just gonna just do an indicator for whether they hold stock 
right? We also do what fraction they hold in stock. We do it with and without retirement accounts, all in the appendix. Uh, and it doesn't matter how you do it, you find the same thing. Uh, they started measuring, HRS started measuring uh, a self-rated risk aversion, I think in 2014, where they just asked people, how risk averse are you? Rate yourself on our scale one to 10. I, you know, I try to avoid risk, I'm more than happy to take risk, sort of thing. There's a number of studies, actually, most of them are in economics, that, that find that this does a better job uh, explaining people's portfolio decisions than something like an income gamble question. <laughs> uh, and then the three, uh, the three uh, belief metrics, right? What are the chances the market goes up next year what, or the market's higher a year from now? What are the chances the market's higher in 20%? What are the chances the market's falling at least 20%? We're gonna look at 11 investor characteristics. So these are all things that other people have looked at before. So we don't really, as long as, as to the extent that they relate to stock participation, nothing we find here is new. To the extent they look at beliefs, most of these things have not been looked at beliefs, so some of that is new. Uh, obviously, I can't talk about all these. I'm just going to focus on trust today in, in some of my analysis uh, and just kind of summarize the other things. And then in everything we do today, we'll control for sex, age, uh, HRS, fixed effects, uh, wave fixed effects, uh, whether retired, whether married, and the 10 genetic principle components. So, uh, so that's basically what we're going to do. So step one. Do these polygenic scores predict stock market participation, risk aversion, and beliefs? I, I presented this paper the very first time. Well, it wasn't the first time, but one of the first times I presented this paper was to an industry group of bankers. Uh, and I sent them my slides, and the guy says, you can't show us tables. you got to put pictures. Uh, so today you'll see. Since then, I, I decided I like pictures better. So today I'm going to focus on pictures. I uh, don't have crayons. Let's see. Uh, so do these polygenic scores predict stock market participation? Do they predict risk aversion? Do they predict beliefs, right? So this is, uh, oh, this is the, the, so just doing a regression of, uh, in the likelihood you own stock on the control variables and the polygenic score. So one standard deviation higher, educational attainment, PGS, you're about 7% more likely to hold stock. So it's a pretty big effect, right? One standard deviation higher, neuroticism, PGS, you're about 4% less likely to hold stock. Myocardial infarction, you're about 2% less likely. BMI, you're about 4% less likely. Everything I show you today is statistically significant at the 1% level, so we'll just be good with that. Uh, <clears throat> the guys over here in the corner have already shown this, right? So that, that's their, their paper on uh, the role of uh, educational attainment and income or wealth. Uh, you know, this was one of the channels they looked at, right? So we kind of knew that one going in, right? Uh, this here is the change. Again, I've got you know, a whole bunch of results uh, but I'm just going to focus on neuroticism here. So this is neuroticism PGS. This is uh, the standardized change in the outcome given a one standard deviation increase in the neuroticism PGS. So higher neuroticism PGS, one standard deviation higher neuroticism PGS, about 6% standard deviation greater risk aversion, right? So pretty substantial relation again, right? People with a higher neuroticism PGS, they think it's about 4% less likely, well, 4% standard deviation, less likely the market will rise in the next year. About 3% more likely the market will rise by at least 20%, and about 5% more likely the market will fall by 20%, right? So what you're seeing here really is greater risk aversion, kind of lower expected return with greater dispersion, right? More risk, right? Is really kind of what a higher neuroticism PGS is predicting. All right, so question one, do these polygenic scores predict stock market participation, risk aversion, and beliefs? Uh, they seem to, but they're certainly correlated with them, right? Uh, in finance, mediation analysis is pretty rare, so I usually do a slide on mediation analysis, but seeing how we've had a couple of them today, I probably will just skip that uh, and assume you know what a mediation analysis means. The only thing I'll say about mediation analysis in this group is that when I talk about direct and indirect effects, I'm talking about direct and indirect mediation effects, not direct and indirect genetic effects, which is, <laughs> yeah, that sometimes gets you too. All right. <clears throat> so these polygenic scores, so, so the second question we have, well, okay, Maybe the reason the polygenic scores are predicting stock market participation is because they're predicting beliefs and risk aversion, right? So we're going to just do a mediation analysis of that. Uh, and you know, remember that the educational attainment PGS was associated with about a 7% greater likelihood you hold stock, right? If you mediate it with the three belief metrics and risk aversion, that accounts for about 1% of that 7%. Almost all the relation, the bulk of the relation, and it's statistically significant. Risk aversion and beliefs matter, right? Part of the reason the, uh, the educational attainment PGS predicts stock participation is because the educational attainment 
uh, PGS is predicting risk aversion and beliefs. And that, it, it's highly significant. All those indirect effects, all four indirect effects are significant. The direct effect, however, is the bulk of it, right? Most of the reason that the educational attainment PGS is predicting uh, stock market participation is not because it's predicting risk aversion and beliefs, right? And we kind of see that pattern throughout, no matter what we look at. Neuroticism, they do a little bit more job, a little bit better. That really comes from risk aversion. Neuroticism is, is the single best predictor of risk aversion of the variables we look at, uh, right? But most of it remains a direct effect, right? This is the, the, the risk aversion, the part of neuroticism this is <clears throat> neuroticism predicting uh, stock market participation because it predicts risk aversion and beliefs. This is neuroticism predicting stock market participation in addition to that, right? Same thing with monoclonal infarction. Uh, same thing with BMI. It's, uh, for BMI, it's almost all a direct effect. So risk aversion and beliefs, they, they do mediate the relation between polygenic scores and stock market participation, but they're not the primary channels that, that, that it looks like, right? I mean, it doesn't seem to be that that's really what's going on here. So we'll do the next part, which is, okay, let's start looking at these polygenic scores and these other variables we know impact stock market participation, or at least we know are correlated with stock market participation. We're going to look at 11 of them. I'm only going to focus on trust today because I'm sure everybody wants to leave eventually. Uh, <clears throat> sort of thing. So here we go. This is the, the change in standardized trust given a one standard deviation increase in the polygenic score. So we do this for the 11 characteristics and the eight polygenic scores. So this is just you know, one of a very small subset of results. I apologize to the discussant for that. Uh, but the educational attainment PGS, not surprising to this group because educational attainment PGS seems to predict everything, right? Also predicts, uh, you know, one standard deviation higher educational attainment PGS, about 14% uh, standard deviation greater trust. Neuroticism, about a 12% lower standard deviation trust. Uh, myocardial infarction, about 5% less uh, trust, and BMI, about 5% less trust as well, right? All statistically significant, right? So these, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the, these, these characteristics are predicted by these polygenic scores, right? Again, just trust in this case, but we look at all 11 of them. So yeah, we find this is the case. Uh, for each characteristic, we find that at least three of the PGSs predict that characteristic. For the average characteristic, I think it's six of the eight PGSs predict the characteristic. So these things are, you know, certainly related to the polygenic scores, you know, empirically. All right, so then we'll do the mediation analysis again, only now, instead of asking whether the polygenic scores are predicting stock market participation because they're predicting risk aversion and beliefs, we'll ask, well, are the polygenic scores predicting stock market participation because they're predicting trust? Or are the polygenic scores predicting uh, risk aversion because they're predicting trust? Or are the polygenic scores predicting beliefs because they're predicting trust? Right? So we're going to ask, we're going to do all those mediation models. Uh, and we find the same sort of thing. So this is, again, you know, Western Aviation Higher Educational Attainment, PGS, uh, is associated with about a 7% greater likelihood you hold stock, right? About 1% of that could be, could be uh, uh, or seems to be related to trust, right? That the, that the educational attainment PGS is predicting trust, and by predicting trust, it's predicting stock market participation. Uh, but the bulk of it, again, you know, 6% of it seems to be a direct effect, right? That the polygenic score is predicting stock market participation, uh, even when we control for trust. And again, we see the same pattern when we go through the other polygenic scores. Uh, you know, trust seems to be a mediator. Uh, but it's not the mediator, right? It doesn't fully mediate the, the relation. All right, kind of summing it up, what we find, because we look at a lot of them here, it, each PGS we look at, we find at least one characteristic that mediates it, right? So these, so these, 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 the PGSs are related to stock market participation, at least in part because they're predicting these characteristics that we know, already know are related to stock market participation, right? Some are fully mediated, right? Uh, height fully mediates the height PGS, right? So, so height PGS predicts, Larger height PGS predicts greater stock market participation, but once you put height in the model, right, that takes it all away. So we can conclude, therefore, that you know that that, that at least in this case, it's fully mediated. That you know essentially the height PGS is predicting stock market participation because it's, it's predicting height. Although there could be other mediators that it's also accounting for, uh, but it really just seems to be that. But most of the PGSs we don't find are fully mediated. Educational attainment PGS still predicts stock market participation when you control for education. Neuroticism PGS still predicts stock market participation when you control for trust or optimism. The BMI PGS still predicts stock market participation when you control for BMI. All right. For risk aversion, uh, it remains strongly related to neuroticism. By far, that's the strongest one for, for risk aversion and coronary disease. The other uh, six PGSs we look at, we find a mediator that fully mediates it. 
You know, there's always this question of power and stuff like that, but in most cases, the mediator is what you would expect, right? That, you know, general cognition uh, PGS is mediated by a measure of general cognition, right? For beliefs, that remains strongly related to educational attainment, my color infarction, for the chance that Mark goes up. Uh, I actually probably should put the chance that Mark goes down by 20%. I think that one's uh, actually more interesting. Neuroticism remains strongly related to the chance that, you know, your view of the likelihood of a market crash. Uh, as is uh, myocardial color infarction uh, and educational attainment. All right, so the last two questions then are really about, you know, can we use these polygenic scores to get some idea, uh, you know, how important these polygenic scores are in driving the relations between these variables? Uh, so th the way that we did this, and we actually did it a couple of ways, but the way that we, the other ways are in the appendix, but the way that we did it in the paper was this. <laughs> We, we, we wanted to kind of, you know, come up with a number, right? So what we did was we took variation in, say, risk aversion, uh, and, and we removed all the variation that was related to the control. So we took out the, the variation in risk aversion that was, you know, related to gender and age and HRS wave and the principal components, the genetic principal components. So then we have this kind of orthogonalized risk aversion, and we just regress the remaining variation on the eight polygenic scores, right? And we call the fitted value the PGS component of risk aversion, and the residual the non-PGS component of, of risk aversion. And because it's a fitted value and a residual, they're orthogonal, which means that we can easily partition the R square, right? The R square just becomes additive. Uh, <clears throat> So we just regress orthogonalized participation on the orthogonalized component of beliefs, the orthogonalized or on the PGS part of beliefs and risk aversion that's predicted by polygenic scores, the part of belief and risk aversion that's not predicted by the, the polygenic scores, and say how much of that relation is predicted by these polygenic scores. So this is 100% is the R square, right? And 30% of it, of that, of that R square, is of the R square between stock participation being predicted by risk aversion of beliefs is due to the part of risk aversion of beliefs that's predicted by these eight polygenic scores, right? So it's a substantial portion. These polygenic scores account for a lot of the relationship, can account for a lot of the relationship between stock participation, risk aversion of beliefs. 70% of it is not due to the poly, or not predicted by the polygenic scores, but a lot of it is. And then finally, we're going to do the same thing uh, with all these uh, um, respondent characteristics, all these investor characteristics, like trust, right? How much of the relationship between trust and beliefs, how much of the relationship between trust and risk aversion, how much of the relationship between trust and stock market participation is due to these eight polygenic scores or can be accounted for that? And we'll just go through the same mechanism. We'll orthogonalize trust. We'll break trust up into two parts, the part that's predicted by the polygenic scores, the part that's not. Uh, and then we'll just regress orthogonalized participation or orthogonalized beliefs or orthogonalized risk aversion on the PGS component, the non-PGS component. And here's what we find for trust. It's a pretty big, it's a pretty big amount, right? So about 40% of the relation between trust and stock participation is due to the part of trust that can be predicted by these eight PGSs. Uh, about 30% of the relation between trust and risk aversion is due to the part of trust that can be predicted by these eight PGSs. For beliefs, uh, on average, or somewhere around 25 to 35% is due to the part of trust that can be predicted by these polygenic scores. When we do it across all 11 characteristics, kind of our, our best estimate or our average estimate is really, I guess, what we should say here, is across all 11, about 40% of the relations on average are due to the variation in these characteristics that's predicted by these polygenic scores. Uh, for risk aversion, it's more like 20%, and for beliefs, it's, on average, it's about 30%. All right. So that's the general paper. Uh, these polygenic scores predict stock participation, they predict risk aversion, they predict beliefs. Uh, most of the relation between the polygenic scores and stock participation is not mediated by risk aversion and beliefs. Uh, but risk aversion and beliefs are important mediators. I mean, they do matter. It's just, it's not the bulk of it, right? These polygenic scores are all related to, I mean, every characteristic we look at is related to the polygenic scores. Uh, so that explains kind of, you know, why we're seeing heritability, at least in part. Um, these characteristics are important mediators. In some cases, they fully mediate, and in many cases, they don't fully mediate, but they are important mediators in all, in all cases of the relation between the polygenic scores and stock participation, of the relation between polygenic scores and risk aversion, and of the relation between polygenic scores and beliefs. Uh, and they, they account for a relatively large fraction, right? It's about 30% of the relation between risk aversion, beliefs, and stock participation. 
and about 40% of the relation between the characteristics and stock market participation. Uh, and I live in the desert, but it also snows. <laughs> One of the things that, I don't know if concerns me is the right word, but it seemed like everything you threw at this worked. And some are easy to tell stories about, like educational attainment or you know, those sorts of things. But other things like BMI, PGS, after controlling for BMI gets trickier. I mean, you can still tell a story about self-control or something, but it gets harder. Uh, I mean, I guess I'm just wondering if you took any PGS, and did this? Does it does it work? Or, or were you able to find ones that didn't? I mean, you know, how do I think about that? Excellent question. Yes, uh, I would say in general, BMI is probably the weakest result we get. We get it, you know, we do get it mediated in most cases, but not in the case of stock market participation. Uh, we also have in the appendix. Uh, so we use version two of the HRS Polygenic scores, and there's a total of 29 of them there. So we actually do it for all the Polygenic scores in the appendix, and we do find ones there. Not I, I don't know, surprisingly or not surprisingly, that that you know have no relation, right? So you know, age of menopause does not appear to have any relation with risk aversion or beliefs or stock participation. I mean, it's you know we, we do find there, uh, but we still find a lot there still matter as well. Uh, uh, you know, a matter, and I don't think it's that surprising a measure of well being given. Given our results here, it's not surprising that uh, PGS for well-being still matters as well. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm glad you think our results are too good. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a little, uh, so I'll call it a concern. Uh, I'm concerned with measurement error in the sense that there are these variables that uh, are really interesting, but they, they, they're surely measured with a lot of error. And so... Hey, just to be clear, are you talking about so, the polygenic scores so or the they, investor characteristics? They are for sure, but I'm actually thinking about things like the risk aversion okay. measure or the belief. Yep. Because if somebody has, so, you know, I ask you at one point in time, you know, what's your list and you're like, bananas. But, like, and that tells me something about you. But actually, uh, there are probably, like, ideally, I'd have, like, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of observations of you telling me about your belief. So I can really get a sense of, 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 of uh, how you think about things. If that's true and there's a lot of measurement error then that mediation analysis is tricky because that's got to be like very much a lower bound yes yes which i think kind of gets at my other interpretation of that that maybe some of what we're measuring is actually variation in say risk aversion that you're capturing with some of these other characteristics maybe to make you feel better the other way we did this again in the appendix was uh for we didn't do it for risk aversion because risk aversion is just measured twice in our data. But for beliefs, where we actually have four measures of beliefs for some people, depends how many times they're there. We took their average belief measure and did it, and we basically find the exact same coefficient. Nothing that really would changes. Average, that would do like every possible, you know, uh, dummy out every possible thing people could say. I mean, just get as much possible variation in there that you could. And then you're like, okay, given the data on beliefs that we have, this is like the most that we're able to show, which is surely still a lower bound, but I, I don't know. I, I, there's a lot of measurement there for mediation analysis. Uh, yes. Sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, everything we measure, even stock market participation is going to be measured with there, right? And but I, I agree. I think the belief metrics and you know and risk aversion are probably, you know, greater error than things like stock market participation or income, which is also measured with there. Tell me if this is right. Did you look at intensive margin or just extensive margin on the stock market participation? Yeah, I don't know those words. Oh, oh so uh, uh, the, the, not just the decision to own stocks or not, but the but the how much you've invested. Yes. In, Stock. Yeah. So, did you look at that second part of the? It, we did. Yeah. So, so the uh, the uh, we look at stock market participation with and without uh, retirement accounts, and then we looked at the fraction of your wealth invested in retirement accounts. We did not look at whether somebody entered the stock market for the first time. Uh, 
I think in most cases here, and we just kind of know this from the HRS data and from other data sets as well, a stock market patient is, is incredibly sticky, right? When somebody gets in, they tend to stay in, and once they get out, they are... It's less so once they get out. It's more once they never got in, they never get in. Yeah, because what, what I was wondering is whether or not consistent results when you look at own stocks versus don't own stocks versus the amount of stocks that you... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we find almost all the exact same results. Okay. Yeah. We have one question. I don't know how easy it is to do. It's probably not, not that easy. But if you could compute this net heritability of stock market participation, so if you had access to the raw genetic data and uh, linked to the, to the stock market participation, I wonder just how much is the net heritability and how much is being captured by all this? The, the heritability measured via PGS or the heritability measured for, I mean, for, for a like a genetic heritability or a heritability yeah. a twins heritability. So you can completely the heritability if you have the raw genetic yeah. data. Yeah, I'm not the best person to speak about this. There's people in the room that know more. But like, if you have the raw genetic data, the, the SNPs, the originally SNPs, you can see how much of the variation in the particular phenotype, the stock market participation, is explained by by the, the SNPs by looking at. So basically, the idea is like you look at whether two individuals the, the SNP correlation is like 0.05, or right? Something. And then you see like what is the heritability. Okay. And then you can see how much of the PGS is. Total are explaining. Yeah, that's, you know, um, that would be interesting to kind of. I, I agree. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, I don't know how. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, could I say one more? Okay. Uh, right. I, I apologize. Use the lawyer tickets. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think this is what Victor just said, but tell me if it wasn't. Okay. Then I'm just free writing on what you said. Uh, so, you, so you did the decomposition analysis go analysis going the one direction, which is, you know, how much of risk aversion or beliefs is the gene part, how much is the non-gene part in the breakdown of the R squared. What I'm wondering is sort of an, the opposite analysis of that, which is when you do the mediation analysis, if we talk about the measurement error question and we take it literally, then what you have left over from those polygenic scores is the part not predicted by the characteristics that are associated with the polygenic scores. If you put all that together, how much of stock market participation can you explain with the residualized polygenic score? part of the polygenic score not predicted. By the by characteristic the, associated. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a great idea. And, and the reason I'm curious, I shouldn't keep talking because you said it's a good idea, but the reason I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you're doing it now by saying something silly. But, um, <laughs> it's only because, again, the stories we can tell sort of make sense when you think about some but not Right? So like educational attainment maybe is associated with something like facility with complex thinking or I can handle uncertainties better. But it would just be sort of interesting to know how much of the genetic stuff is left over that's operating through the mechan you know, mechanisms that aren't picked up by the operator. Right. No, I, I agree. And I think really the way I would interpret that is other characteristics we haven't identified yet yeah, to exactly. some extent. Right? That, that they're measuring that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Regressing the residuals onto it, though, isn't that just the same as controlling, like, by first vowel? Like, it is. Your yeah, you're is right. Different, right? So then no, no, it's literally. So it's in fact, the way you're saying it is better because you get the covariance matrix right. Right? When yeah, so that's just. When you residualize it separately and then put, on, put in all the residuals, you break the covariance. So just throwing them all into the regression at the same time. Yeah, it, so, it, I, I, so yeah. I, I think you're. Right, right. That the, basically the direct genetic effect is essentially the residualized value of the genetic after toy that. The difference, what that I think maybe you're talking about that we don't do is include them all at once, and we don't do that because we're just looking at them one at a time. Uh, and, and I think and, about, like the R squared, like how you know how much of the R squared is still left to be explained. Yeah, so like a marginal R squared or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, so Kevin had reached out to me about this and. Uh, I was actually quite excited because I don't know this literature that much on genetics. Um, so I thought it would be good actually to, to see what's going on in the field. And I was also excited to get this paper because I work a lot on subjective expectations and preferences uh, in, in, in terms of understanding decision making, not in the co context of stock market participation, uh, but it's similar questions that, uh, that I think about. So, you know, at the at the end of the day, a lot of us are interested in trying to understand how people make decisions under uncertainty, right? So 
In this particular case, it's going to be about stock market participation, and it's going to be something about, you know, there, there are going to be differences in beliefs across people in terms of returns to the stock market. Differences in preferences, you could think about that in terms of like, you know, differences in risk preferences or ambiguity preferences, uh, ambiguity aversion or, or whatever other preferences you have in mind. So uh, what I thought was, what is pretty, pretty interesting about this idea of connect, collecting data on genetics is there is, uh, for people who do collect these data on, for example, beliefs, there tends to be a lot of heterogeneity in these beliefs. And we just can't explain most of it. OK, so let's come back to this context of uh, stock market participation where people have been tr uh, uh, trying to understand what drives this, uh, the, the, the variation in the population in terms of stock market participation. It's pretty well documented that it is somewhat related to risk preferences. There is work actually going back. I think Mike Hurd and Chuck Mansky separately have done quite a bit of work on beliefs about returns to stock market and to what extent that uh, that drives choice, uh, these, the decision to enter the stock market. But what, what we find from that literature is actually you can explain very, a very small part of the variation um, uh, in stock market participation. And then the other thing which I, which I mentioned uh, uh, just a slide ago is there tends to be a lot of heterogeneity in beliefs across people, okay? Some of that, yes, you can explain that through standard observables or characteristics, but we just can't explain a large part of it, right? And that's, if you can give me a variable, in this case, for example, it's genetics, and if you can tell me, okay, this is a variable which could explain some of that heterogeneity as an applied researcher, I would find that, that variable really use, useful to use, for example, uh, in my work. So that's why I thought it was actually pretty interesting and I wanted to learn more about, about this literature. Similarly, and this is, this is related to, I think, uh, Orazio's point about initial conditions. In a lot of work, we do know that there's a lot of heterogeneity in beliefs. When information arrives, people update their beliefs, but these initial beliefs seem to matter a lot. And a lot of work, even when we, like, you know, whether you're collecting expectations data or not, we take these prior beliefs as given, and we just don't know where they're coming from, right? So again, if, if you could give me, give, give me a variable that could explain some of this heterogeneity, that would be immensely useful. In, in order to understand where, where some of the heterogeneity is coming from. So that in that, with that backdrop, I thought this, this idea of collecting genetics data and the idea behind this paper actually is quite appealing. So what this paper does is uh, they're going to use uh, the HRS data. Um, a lot of stuff is otherwise pretty standard, like when it says standard, standard as an applied micro researcher, right, who doesn't use genetics data. So they have data on risk preferences, on beliefs, but what's going to be at least new for me here are these polygenic scores, right? A lot of people in this room know those data. So I think uh, the paper has the potential to help us better understand what explains the, the, the decision to participate in the stock market. So at least the, paper, the, the version that I got was focusing um, on, on uh, the extensive margin. And then I also thought that with these data, we can say something about the heterogeneity in beliefs and risk attitudes. And the paper does, does a, a little bit, uh, bit of that. So I did, uh, so let me, let me give you the framework of the paper and then I'll give you my comments. So I'm, I'm simplifying the model that they have uh, in the paper. So it's good that you use figures. I can actually show some equations. So, uh, so, you know, it's, I'm, I'm simplifying. The framework is much richer because as was mentioned, they have, they are on a lot of, they have many different polygenic scores they have a lot of individual controls and so on. Let's ignore all of that for a moment. So, you know, the dependent, we, we're interested in trying to explain people's stock market participation. And they're regressing this onto the individuals. Let, let's assume there's only one polygenic score, okay? For the, for the sake um, of this example. And they're regressing that onto some observable characteristics. Think of that as the individual's risk attitude uh, or their beliefs, okay? Let's assume each of them is just, uh, uh, it's, it's just a single uh, dimensional vector. Okay, so that's, like if you think about what's new here is we usually wouldn't have data on, on, on the polygenic score. So prior work typically just writes down a model where you don't have this PG and you regress this onto a vector of Zs and Xs. Okay, so the other thing that they do in this paper is they're also interested in trying to understand how much of this risk preference or beliefs could be co is correlated with this polygenic score. So they, they, they have equations of this form. And then what, what you can do is if you were to estimate a model just using the polygenic score for getting the Z sub i, 
this is the total effect, right? In the, in the context of this model. And then they're going to break this down into what they call a direct effect within this mediation analysis. That's going to be this alpha sub one in this, uh, so alpha sub one, and then there's an indirect effect, which is coming to the effect of this polygenic score affecting the individual's risk preference, okay? So this is what basically the paper does in many different ways. They're going to do this for beliefs, for preferences, for, for observable characteristics. And what they find is uh, that the polygen, maybe a lot of you already knew this, but for me, a lot, some of these things were new, that the polygenic score does predict stock market participation. It also predicts risk aversion and beliefs. And then even if you condition on those things, the polygenic score still predicts stock market participation. And they're also, they also show that it can predict a variation in other responded characteristics that have been shown to explain stock market participation. So the paper has the potential, I think, to say something about, because that's the goal, I think. That's what they want to say, like how genetic endowments affect choices. I'm not sure they really can get at that, and I'll talk about that. But I think the paper definitely has potential uh, to do that. So let me, before I go to, into the comments, I have learned a lot throughout the day, and I did learn a lot uh, from the paper itself. So let me talk about uh, how do, at least within this mediation analysis context, it's not really clear to me, especially when you have so much data on, on a lot of observable characteristics and a lot of polygenic scores, but you, uh, everything is done not simultaneously. It's really hard for me how to think about this distinction between the direct and, the, and indirect effects. So this is the same model as before, but think about, you know, in the, in the error term, think about this, some omitted variable, some variable that actually matters for stock market participation, something like ambiguity aversion, okay, which me as a researcher doesn't observe, okay, so that's all in the, in the error term. Now, this, if you think that this polygenic score or some of your polygenic scores are correlated with that, with, whether that's a preference or whether that's a belief or any other trait, if you have this non-negative correlation, then you know what you're calling the direct effect within this mediation analysis is going to be pe picking a part of that effect, right? So what I'm saying in other words is if I continue to give you more variables and you start writing down a richer model, the part that you're, what, what you're explaining or what's the direct effect is going to keep going down, right? So in that framework, it's actually very, very hard to think about like, you know, what, uh, the, 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 the distinction somewhat seems arbitrary or, or somewhat artificial. And I think if we really want to understand within this media, so, so that, that's, that's my, what, my first point about like, how do we interpret these effects? And I, I'm not quite sure. I think this is a broader comment, not necessarily about this paper, but just as someone who's an outsider. For someone like who, you know, or people who write on models, even whether they have beliefs data or some other data where they want to put down some heterogeneity, what I'm still not sure is, it's, I, I learned a lot, I, and it's valuable to know that part of this heterogeneity, whether it's in beliefs or in preferences, is coming from these uh, polygenic scores. But at the practical level, it's not clear to me how do I incorporate that in models that I write down as an applied researcher, okay? So that's something, again, it's a very, uh, very general point. Uh, so one, one thing that I thought before I read the paper is, okay, maybe I could use these polygenic scores as an IV, as a, as, as a shifter for beliefs. You can't really do that, okay? So if I, if I can't do that, then it's still, yes, I can explain some of the heterogeneity, but I can't really use this, that information in a way that allows me to write down a model of expectation formation and get some exogenous variation, okay? So another thought, thing which I thought, and I think some other people might have done this because you have this very rich data on beliefs, and I know this is not what this paper is about, there is a large literature on biases in beliefs. You have data on beliefs, and um, within your context, there's a lot of heterogeneity, and some people are clearly wrong, and it would be interesting to understand what explains uh, some of those biases. Okay, so this is just a general comment, and I would be curious to hear from others who work, uh, work in this space. Okay, this is something that was mentioned by Nick also, especially, you know, measurement, error, there's always going to be measurement error in these things, especially when you do these decomposition exercises, that's going to matter a lot, right? Because there's good reason to believe that the extent of measurement error in these polygenic scores is quite different from the measurement error that you're getting in these other survey variables. Now, which one has more measurement error or less? I have no idea. I have no pride on this. You guys would know better. But I think that's something, if you're going to be doing these decomposition exercises, it's very, very important to think about. 
Okay. So the, my, my, my very last point is actually pretty straightforward. What I was hoping to see, especially as someone who doesn't work in this literature was, you have all these additional variables. Before you go into any of these decompositions, I wanted to see how much do these additional variables buy you. So you have these, uh, these you break down these R squares in terms of how much of it is explained by the polygenic score and so on. But I don't think there's anything in the paper, maybe there was something that I missed, which is how much additional variation can these scores explain full stop in terms of explaining choices in, and in terms of explaining the variation in these preferences and beliefs. And I think that's pretty straightforward to do. Uh, so that's all, that's all I have. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, and I hope to continue to learn from this literature.